Hello, and welcome to This is USG, a video podcast by the universities at Shady Grove. Nine universities, one campus, great results. I'm Ann Kadimian, Executive Director of the Universities at Shady Grove. In the social sciences, many scholars make a point of drawing a line between the study of a topic and the practice of it. For example, if someone is a student of politics, they may observe and analyze, but they often don't engage in order to keep an objective distance. Our guest this evening brings a very different perspective to his leadership of the UMBC political science program at USG. Dr. Sunil Dasgupta combines his scholarship and deep knowledge of politics with his experience running for office to inspire students to not only understand the political world, but to engage in the political process locally, whether they hate politics or not. His new podcast, I Hate Politics, explores race, climate change, police reform, and so much more in engaging and cutting edge discussions that bring politics to life for all of us. We are fortunate tonight to have him as our guest, Dr. Sunil Dasgupta, director of the UMBC political science program at USG. Welcome to This is USG. Thank you. Great to be here. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. I, I wonder if we could start if you could just tell us your path to political science. Why political science? What brought you to the study of politics and, and to USG as well? Well, it was really accidental. Um, uh, I, my undergraduate is actually in uh, financial accounting and economics. Uh, and I was on that path. Um, and at some point after graduating college, which was in India at that time, um, I realized that this was not for me. And so thereafter, um, I uh, was looking, uh, you know, as most students, uh, many grad, uh, recent grad, college graduates do, and I was looking around and I saw this ad in the newspaper saying the Times of India is looking for trainee journalists. Uh, and I um, wrote a letter of application and I took the train to d personally deliver it to, in Delhi. <laughs> And I went there um, in, they took about three months to figure out. I uh, lived in those three months with uh, my friend's mom, uh, who was very kind enough to, um, you know, let me have, uh, live in her house. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, I got the job. Uh, I became a, I became a training reporter. Uh, and then I did, um, and I was a reporter for about six, seven, eight, almost seven, eight years uh, before uh, I began to realize that I needed an education in order to be able to continue to do what I was doing. And uh, it just so happened that at that time, the one of my editors, um, and I was, at, when I, in by 1991, I had joined this um, a magazine um, um, fortnightly called uh, India Today, which is similar in design to Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had a much bigger circulation than Time Magazine, five million or more. Wow. Uh, and I was the, uh, and I became the uh, national security correspondent for that magazine. And at that magazine in, in 95, 96, uh, my boss at that time uh, called and said, hey, do you want to go and take a six month sabbatical uh, at the University of Illinois? I was like, sure. <laughs> Can I go, when, when should I go? So he said, um, call this guy, his name is Steve Cohen. And he's a you know well-known um, uh, Indian military expert, mm -hmm. and I was doing national security reporting. So I called him, and one thing led to another, and I was arrived in East Central Illinois uh, <laughs> for a little um, you know learn and uh, for a learning experience. And uh, I sat in on a lot of uh, courses, um, and I realized really that I needed that education. And so as I was leaving, uh, I I you know visited many. Um, of the professors I got to know. And they said, have you, you know, why didn't you apply for graduate school? So I said, oh, that's a good idea. But I, you know, an MA is expensive. I don't have the money. So somebody said, apply for the PhD, they'll pay you and then you don't have to pay for it. So, <laughs> so uh, I applied for the PhD program and I took my GRE one day before I was about to come back to India. And so I came back to India. Luckily in that year, I was accepted uh, by the University of Illinois. That's the only school I applied to. Uh, mm -hmm. And I went back in, in September um, to start at the University of Illinois in, in 1996. 
uh, that's my path to political science. Um, I, the first couple of years was very hard because I had literally no background in any social science uh, related work, except I knew some, you know, micro and macroeconomics and all of that, but I didn't know, um, you know, I hadn't read any of the classics or anything. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard, but in about two to three years, I began to get a hang of it. Um, and then things look better. And then once I had my PhD, I crossed over into thinking, oh my, you know, this is very interesting. I love the idea of figuring out why different people live differently. Yeah, that's great. So how did you come to USG? How did you come to UMBC and USG? Okay, so uh, from at, at Illinois, I finished up my um, coursework and then I got a job uh, at the Brookings Institution. Uh, to do uh, to work there, um, and in 2000, I came to uh, I I came to Washington D.C. to work at Brookings. Uh, that's also where I met my wife. She used to work there, um, and then um, you know um, I finished up my dissertation. Uh, 2003, I defended. Uh, then I um, worked at Georgetown, um, and then finally uh, UMBC made me. Uh, an offer to come to and, and lead the uh, USG program um, in 2009. So, so I've been at USG uh, for, you know, 12 years. That's awesome. What a great experience to be at Brookings. Brookings yeah. is one of those, it's one of those cool places. It's at, at that intersection of analysis and research and actual policy making. And I bet that was a lot of fun to be at Brookings. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there is, it is such a great experience. You, and you, you know, you learn the research, the craft of research, and you're engaged in it. And, you know, the different distinction you made between policy and politics, I've often found that distinction fake. Um, a good policy is always based in theory, and good theory is always applicable. And that's, and of course, there's a lot of work that we do that's, I think, you know, spinning wheels. But Really, to me, those two are not separable uh, in the way that many people separate. Yeah, I agree. No, I think you're you're right on. I think we need we need both conceptual thinking and practice, and the two have to combine on a regular basis. So, absolutely, yeah. So, tell us a little bit about the political science program at UMBC as it as it has taken shape at Shady Grove. Maybe you can share a little bit about what students study in the political science program, but also. Uh, maybe you can give us a, any stories of students, you know, what they've gone on to do coming out of the political science program as well. Right. So, you know, UMBC committed to running uh, a, a bunch of programs uh, at Shady Grove. Um, and, um, you know, the university has made it a very, um, you know, it's, 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 it's it has kept up to its commitment mm -hmm. um, to do that. Um, the political science program when I started was about, you know, 20, 22, 23 students at that time. Um, and I came in and I was figuring out, you know, what the program looked like, what it was doing. Um, and I started, and it took me a few years to learn about the program. Uh, the first thing I realized uh, about being at USG is that I like to say, I like to say this a lot. So if you've heard it, pardon me, uh, which is that um, I feel like I'm at the cutting edge of democratized higher education in a way that I was not before, and that led me to do a bunch of things um, that and that reshaped the program. So the first among the first decisions I made was to offer evening classes. Undergraduate programs at UMBC, and I think generally are not allowed, were not allowed at that time to offer <laughs> evening courses. Uh, and, you know, I, I was, I, I insisted on it. And I insisted on it for two reasons. Not, not only that fact that, you know, my students were working, but also I was denied quality instructors because quality instructors almost always had other jobs. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and so I, you know, I wanted, to have people teach who knew something about this, right? And 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 all the people that really knew, they were good and they were employed and they were not going to come to me in between nine and five. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I and those are the two reasons I started doing that in the in, in the evening. And now, of course, you know, many more programs offer evening uh, courses. So you know, that's the among the first sort of battles I fought. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, and, you know, and over time, I began to understand better. I think the big turning point in the program, um, and, and okay, so let me, maybe I should just say this. So we focused on the pre-law area, mm-hmm. we focused on international relations, and we focused on public policy in different sort of, you know, uh, streams, right? And we did this for, you know, four or five years um, until one day, um, a student of mine, as I was teaching American foreign policy, says to me, um, why are you making me read this? And I didn't have a good answer for her at, immediately, but I went home and I have struggled with that question ever since, to be honest. Uh, and that changed the, co- my, the course of my life. It's changed the course of the program. It changed really almost everything that I do. Uh, ha- have done thereafter, right? Uh, and to the point where I have not gone back to teach American foreign policy because I have not had a better answer to give her than to say that I was teaching from those texts because they were taught to me. And they, that seemed to me a weak reason for doing what I was doing. And so I began to think about what the role of political science was in politics. And you m- mentioned this sort of you know, uh, scientific distance idea, right? To, to hold ourselves at a distance uh, from uh, our subject matter. But I have not met a biologist, right? A botanist, for example, who became a botanist just to do dissections. They became botanists because they love plants. Yeah. They become, you know, people study ants because that's what they love. They fall in love with what they do. And we were asking in politics, which is such an emotive kind of thing anyway, we are asking students to hold themselves off from the emotion of politics, which is the very thing that makes politics exciting. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I, once I realized that, I, I came to this re- conclusion that we were, I think, doing this wrong. Mm-hmm. And since then, I've been trying to change the, na- the direction of my program to be much more about engagement, about empowerment, and about making change. And once I asked my students to do that, once the program started to doing that, then I asked myself, Sunil, what are you doing about this? And you know that led me to set up a nonprofit. Then it led me to run for office and now run this podcast. So it's a that's the sort of trajectory of it. And it really took one student to ask a question that students generally do not ask, which is, why on earth are you having me read this, professor? It, it took a student asking a question, but it also took you really taking it seriously and really thinking it through and responding to it. You know, you use the term democratizing higher education. So when you use that term, do you mean making higher education more accessible or do you mean uh, really transforming how we teach and what we teach? I think those two are related actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, so it has to be more accessible. So in the, in the United States, we as a country, as a society have decided that anybody that wants a um, uh, undergraduate degree should have it, right? This is a decision that we have come, we have, that's, this is a social consensus, I would say, uh, that we have come to. And it, we have come to this because we have evidence now that going to college makes you, you know, uh, much more productive, et cetera, et cetera, right? So all those things we know. Um, and, and so if, if somebody wants it, then we should have it. And as a consequence, you know, the number of people in college has increased. But also, you know, we have retention issues. We have all kinds of issues as a consequence of it. And we can't pretend to be teaching the same things, this, teaching the same way that we were teaching in 1975 when a very select few actually went to college. Mm-hmm. I think the way that we think about college is, is, it has to be different. So the one, the one way in which often this gets translated is that, you know, it becomes college becomes about workforce development. And I disagree with that, mm-hmm. right? Workforce development has always been central to any, it has been central to the divinity school in, at Harvard when it was set up, right? It was workforce development in, 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 in some ways. So the, to me, there was something, we, there was, we had to figure out a way right, where we would be, where we would take what we were doing and make it into, um, and and make it more accessible and available. 
the truth of the matter is that there is a, as you expand the pool, right? You're not going to get traditionally trained students. Okay, traditionally ready students. So for example, I, re I realized that, you know, I had a student who didn't do well in class at all. Didn't do well in class at all. And I was wondering what to do. And I was, didn't know, um, but on a whim, just purely on a whim, right? I said, Floor, go talk to Carla Silvestri, who's now actually in um, on the school board, uh, Montgomery County School Board. And she used to be at the uh, Office of Community Partnerships in, um, in, in the county executive's office. And I was, and I said, Carla, I have a student. Will you talk to her? If you, you have this open position, maybe think about her. And she became an intern there and it was the best thing that happened to her. It was literally the best thing. So I realized from that, that even though I was trying to get her in the traditionally in the classroom, I was not able. Right. But however, if we did a different approach, I think we, I, I was able to reach her. So a couple of, couple of examples of students that have actually done, you know, we send lots of students to law school and to work for different politicians. We had uh, one of my students uh, who was on Michelle Obama's advance team. Uh, we have, you know, all kinds of fun things, but, you know, but uh, a good one is actually uh, delegate uh, Gabriel Severo, who is a Maryland delegate and the leader of the house uh, in, in Maryland um, when it comes to police reform and accountability. And of course, as you, you know, uh, I did a um, podcast episode uh, with him. Um, the other one that I'm really, really proud of is a student called Ed Cornell. And Ed, um, you know, took an Asia policy, uh, you know, um, politics class with me at that time, which is when I was teaching that. And he went off, actually did something totally different. He started a food truck. Uh, in DC, and if you ever in uh, if you're ever in DC and see Milk Cult DC, which is a food truck, and they make you know co coffee, they have cold coffee brews and you know organic ice cream. Say hi to Ed. Um, and I'm very very proud of him. He wrote me after he started. He said, you know that Asia policy course you took that really helped me set up um, uh, the business. And I and and you, you know that's the kind of thing that I would like. Uh, to convey to my students that politics is not just, you know, um, as I say, about Biden or Trump or elections, right? Uh, it's about so many things. It's ubiquitous in so many ways that, you know, we can take this and make and really change our lives. We can transform our lives. Yeah, I, I, I love it, Sunil. I love the democratizing higher education and all of the implications of it. That's fantastic. So tell me, you you said in passing you ran for office, but tell us a little bit more about that. That's a big decision to make, Sunil, to put your hat in the ring, to raise money, you know, to put yourself out there on positions. You know, what what was that process like? You know, I know you said you felt challenged to put kind of put your money where your mouth was in terms of, you know, your students saying, you know, you've got to you've got to live engage as well. But you know, what pushed you to do that? And and what was that process like? So on the one hand, I felt like I had to model, um, you know, engagement for my students. On the other, I had, I have three kids myself in <laughs> MCPS. Um, and I, you know, I have a, and most of my students come from MCPS, right? So I have a very good sense of what MCPS is doing right and what it's not, mm -hmm. right? And, and I have a job that is flexible in 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 that in in a sense. So I could actually serve on the board and remain, um, you know, at at my job. I would cross fertilize my job with my with with my school board uh, duties if I had one. So I should say I did lose, uh, and that's important to note because, you know, running for office, we lose. Somebody has to lose. Somebody somebody will win, and somebody has to lose. But to me, the whole experience has is, is been incredible, incredible, uh, enriching. And, you know, I did it in the COVID year. How many political scientists do you know that ran a, <laughs> a political campaign in the COVID year? It is, it is, it, it's, it's been extraordinarily, extraordinarily enriching 
Um, and I am I am really grateful for the opportunity to have done it. Um, but you know, the schools, 30, 50, you know, 50% of third graders in MCPS do not currently read at grade level. Right? I was talking to um, a um, Montgomery Blair stats teacher uh, recently on the podcast about ma ma how you teach math. And we really are antiquated in the way we teach math. Mm -hmm. We are, we teach math. Things are changing now in the last 20 years or so, but up, up until 20 years ago, we were teaching math just like we, were, we would have taught it 150 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And so we, are, we have to figure out all of these parts of the problem. And I thought I would bring to the board a sensibility and understanding of public policy um, that uh, that was, you know, not there. Um, for example, uh, you know, one of the things that I found about the board is when you look, when you listen to the board, the they don't talk to each other. If you listen to school board proceedings, they really don't talk to each other on, you know, during meetings. They talk to staff and it's like a ping pong between a board member and a staff and then another board member and a staff. And so it goes on and on. The question is, if you if you are to take collective action, which the board is supposed to take, then they have to have communication. Without direct communication, you can't have collective action. Yet in Maryland, we have Open Meetings Act, which means that they cannot meet as a group outside the context of an open of a board meeting. They cannot even have dinner together as a as a group. So they cannot have quorum ever. Right. So where are they having that conversation that would enable collective action? And, and that insight comes from my understanding of public policy. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was going to bring that. I was going to bring, you know, these things about the academic part. I was I'm a teacher, you know, I and you know, and, and so the whole thing came together and the possibility of, you know, of, of making that difference was really really exciting to me yeah well maybe you'll run again maybe we'll see you run, again. <laughs> run or run for some other office as well i can't wait to well see you me. know it, it it really took up a, a year of my life <laughs> i bet i bet I, and your families as well i'm sure so yeah well um, they have to agree but, i think that's that's a huge part you know my but my, my family was good about it and um you know my especially my kids they were they would roll their eyes uh, <laughs> You know, and you know, oh, you—that's the speech you gave the fifteenth time. You know, all of that. But you just, you know, they were, they were, they were good about it. And in the end, they even, um, uh, you know, uh, went out and, and campaigned uh, on my behalf. That's great. So you've got this uh, background that says I hate politics, and we've referenced we've referenced your uh, your podcast a couple of times here. You, you've got a really interesting cutting edge uh, podcast that really digs deeply into some some tough but critically important issues. Um, and, you know, having some really great conversations for everyone to learn from. Tell us how you started this podcast and why the title I Hate Politics? Where does that come from? So um, the way that we started the podcast, because so during the campaign, I was doing these Thursday night chats. Uh, parent teacher Thursday night chat. So I'd invite a bunch of parents, I'd invite a bunch of teachers, and I'd have this talk about, you know, special education or the, um, you know, uh, reading curriculum or, you know, um, reopening or whatever else was the topic du jour, right? And um, so after I lost and I was rooting around for things, anyway, I was moping around a little bit. Uh, I got a call from um, uh, one a, a assistant principal in MCPS who actually is part of a group of three um, principals, MCPS principals that runs a um, a podcast themselves called Ed's Not Dead, and it's a you know they talk about education policy, and they reached out and said, "Hey, have you ever thought of doing a podcast?" I am, and or to be honest, I'm not, I've never been a bunch of a podcast listener. I listen to one or two. My daughter, my youngest daughter actually listens to more podcasts than I do. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, I was like, hmm, I did not think about that. And, but over the winter, uh, I thought about, you know, what they, what they asked. And finally, it took me about three months um, to figure out 
you know, what was I going to do if I was going to do it? And my first podcast was uh, February 8th. I did not know anything about sound editing or how, what mics look like. By the way, this is a, this is a loan from a former student of mine. <laughs> it's very official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, um, and, and so that's, that's how I came to it. Once I decided to do it, I was rooting around for a name. I was thinking Moko Beat, Moko this, that. You know, I wanted to be local and I wanted to be, you know, um, evocative. Uh, but then my uh, wife said, you know what you say all the time is that you say that people hate, you know, people tell you that they hate politics. And this has been my experience. So first with students, right? So they will say, oh, why are you asking me to do study political science? when I hate politics. On the campaign trail, people will say, why should I give you money? I hate politics. Why, why are you even wasting my time talking to me? I hate politics. I don't do politics. And the most polite people will say, you know, education policy or healthcare or police reform, whatever else is, the, is their pet um, policy, that's a moral issue. It's not a political issue. Right. And to me, as a political scientist, it seemed sort of backwards to think about separate pub policy from politics in that way. And the only way that you can separate public policy from politics is by, um, you know, moving to a dictatorship or a monarchy. If you have a democracy, then public policy and politics are intricately linked. Right. So you can't say, oh, I want good roads, but I don't want to engage in politics. I want good schools, but I don't want to engage in politics. I want, you know, the, um, you know, the police to do its job, but I don't want politics. That's not that that doesn't make sense. So and I've heard this a lot. And so therefore, I decided to use this uh, as the name of the podcast. Um, and the podcast is essentially an answer to this, uh, this problem. Uh, that we have. We have huge disengagement, um, especially among young people. Um, and, and even in Montgomery County, which is, you know, very uh, politically active uh, in many ways, we are, there's huge disengagement. And my goal is to engage those that are not disengaged, that, that are disengaged, I beg your pardon. Yeah. You know, thinking about your background as a journalist before you got your PhD, there's, there's a lot of um, you know, listening to your podcast, there's a, a bit of an investigative journalistic edge to what you do as well. You know, you're, it's, it's pretty intense. You get into some great conversations and great discussions, and you really aim for accountability, I think, in your, in your conversations as well. I wonder, is there, a, is there a thread that goes back to your journalistic days and how you approach I Hate Politics, or is there not necessarily a connection there? Well, you know, it is and it isn't, big, but I don't personally believe that I am providing as a person, as, as a uh, personally providing the checks and balances that, you know, that voters and residents provide, right? Mm -hmm. But there are many layers to, to this, right? Mm -hmm. Why, you know, first of all, um, I want to engage those that are disengaged. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a thought about why are people disengaged, mm -hmm. right? Um, anodyne answers are disengaging, right? That's so if there is an anodyne answer, and I, I will follow that up, with, you know, sort of, please explain yourself. Yeah. Um, and um, the other part is that I am modeling research behavior. I am modeling questioning of government for my students, for those that are not part of the political process. So there is a, you know, it's not me personally you know, holding anybody to account. I, do, I that's not my, that's not the role. I mean, if I run for office one again sometime, maybe I'll <laughs> I'll take that more seriously. But right, I don't believe that's that's my role. Right, my role is to engage people who are outside of the political system, the people that say or mean that they hate politics. Mm -hmm. Right, and in order to do that, you know, I want to give, I want to bring to them the kind of information that will get them engaged. Yeah. That'll uh, that'll also show them that if they ask questions themselves that they will get answers. Yeah. And if they don't get answers, then what else can they do? Yeah. Yeah. 
You know, I, so I'm, I'm learning a lot about you, Sunil, as you think, how you think about the work that you do. And I love the way you say you model, you, you're, you're trying to model some of this engagement and, and research as well, because right. this is when, I, you know, to your point that you don't have to go into politics or study political science with a political science degree, right? right. You can open up an awesome, uh, you know, business with a food truck, right? If Correct. you understand the politics, if you understand power dynamics, if you understand coalition building, if you understand all kinds of things that go along with that. So, so I find this really fascinating. And I think this is, you know, the, I, I'm understanding more and more the attractiveness of the political science uh, program to our students as well, you know, who really, who really, I, I think, especially, you know, I'm not going to speak generationally here, but I see among many of the, you know, the generation of, you know, 20 year olds and 30 year olds, you know, a real, a real sense of, um, you know, need to really dig in and to understand and to address big problems and to have the tools to do so. And so I think your, your, the program is probably does that on a big scale as well. Um, yes, we do. And all our students, and we had a small program, but we hit above our, you know, beyond our yeah. um, uh, level, right? Yeah. Um, we are overrepresented on the um, student council. Um, we are um, we overrepresented in almost all forums on campus and outside of campus. Um, the problem, you know, the the larger problem has been one reason why you know we don't get that many students. We are about you know in the forty. Up, up 40s range, uh, 50s, we don't, is because, you know, there isn't a, um, a uh, AA program, the associates program in at Montgomery College in political science. Mm -hmm. So there isn't the pipeline. So people are, when we don't have that easy pipeline, like, for example, that psychology has, or, you know, business has, right, or STEM <laughs> the STEM uh, programs have, right? And so we are actually building um, the interest as, you know, as we, as we go along. So it's, so one of the reasons I also have this public profile is to build that, re, uh, that interest in uh, political science, in our program, in USG. And I am hopeful that, you know, we will, we will move the, um, we will increase interest um, in, in the campus and in the program. Yeah, I think that's that's great. Tell me a little bit about I've heard, you know, I'm I'm new to USG and we haven't been on campus, but I've heard about these Wednesday wipeouts um, that that uh, you know lift up really interesting conversations. Tell us about how this got started and what role what role Wednesday wipeouts plays in the program. Right. So um, Wednesday wipeout is just uh, a program I thought up about ten years, eleven years ago, mm -hmm. um, and what it is is a Wednesday noon hour. Uh, current affairs discussion group that you know we I I, I reserve a, um, a seminar room and you know whoever is free at that time comes and the last you know what you know since last March we've been doing this online so if anybody listening wants to join please reach out to me I have a um, you know um, a, a, a WebEx link that you can join no problem I'm really really happy to have you um, also we invite. Um, of potential students uh, from uh, Montgomery College. Uh, we use that as a recruitment tool, all of those things. The crux of the idea of the group is that we come together and we discuss what's on people's minds, mm -hmm. not some kind of, you know, sort of set agenda. Mm -hmm. So we will end up talking about Prince and we will end up talking about uh, the IMF. Mm -hmm. We will end up talking about, um, you know, um, the voters' rights and we will end up talking about, uh, you know, MCPS. So there is, uh, so we have, we really range widely. Uh, we talk a lot about food and food politics. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and, and uh, it's been, we, I've been doing this for, you know, since 2010, I believe. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll fill up a room and sometimes it'll be me and uh, Dr. Nolan, who is our uh, history program director. And, mm -hmm. you know, we will, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, right now, uh, when semester is ending, um, we don't have many students showing up, but we continue to meet. That's my commitment. My commitment is as much as I can, I will be there every Wednesday. And if anybody wants to show up, they can show up. And we will have a conversation, whatever it is that's on their mind. 
And you will see that, you know, it's faculty, it's staff, it's students, and they, we come together um, and really have, a, you know, have this uh, discourse, which is, you know, USG, because it's not a um, residency, resident school, right? We don't have uh, dorms and things. Mm -hmm. um, student life is harder yeah. uh, to build. Um, and I think this is, uh, for a decade now, uh, a, a strong part of our student life. Very much so. Well, Sunil, this has been a delight to talk with you. And, uh, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. Keep on modeling great democratic engagement, great research, and really challenging all of us to think hard about what's important around us and to get engaged and to not only just vote, but care and dig in and learn about the issues around us. And thank you for your I Hate Politics podcast. And uh, thank you for all you do for USG. It's great to talk with you. Well, thank you very much. And I really appreciate your um, coming to USG. I really ha appreciate having a boss who is a public policy expert. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, I hope to uh, really work closely together uh, as the campus and our programs grow. Absolutely. Lots of good work ahead together. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you.